Although there are a few chapters early on in Philip Jose Farmer's novella, The Lovers, that are set either on Earth or in transit in space, most of the chapters, most of the text, most of the action, most of the character development, and certainly the resolution of the story are taking place on the planet of Oz again, including the the interactions between the lovers that furnishes the title of the story, Jeanette and Hal. So it's important to look at this setting, particularly since it plays such an important role in the story itself in a number of different ways. That's part of what makes this novella such a great work of literature, the world building that goes into it and how that meshes into the characters and, and the plot and the action in a very short, um, relatively speaking, piece of, of science fiction literature. And there is some discussion about linguistics on the part of Hal, the main character, because he is a jack of all trades linguist. He is sent along on the expedition to Oz again, precisely to help out with the language and uh, communications. And in chapter five, we, we have him in transit, learning uh, as best as he can from the previous expedition's accounts, the language of the Wogglebugs, the Ozigan natives, right? And I'm going to skip over all of that because we're more interested in what we could call their sociology and history and the evolution of life on uh, Ozigan. So I'm going to pick up here. Uh, he says, Sido, the landmass in the Southern Hemisphere, was about the size, though not the shape of Africa, and separated from the other by 10,000 miles of ocean. If the Wog geologists were correct, it had once been part of a Gowanda land, right, which is a, a massive continent, but then it drifted away. Evolution had taken a somewhat different path from that on the other continent. And so here's the first discussion of evolution. There's really three main ways in which evolution is going on this, this globe. So he says, whereas the other continent, the northern continent, had been dominated by insects and their distant cousins, the endoskeletal pseudoarthropods, this land mass had been very hospitable to mammals, though Sigmund knew there was an abundance of insect life on it. The sentient species on Abaka too, the northern landmass, had been until 500 years ago the Wogglebug. On Sido, it had been a remarkably human looking animal. Their Homo Ozigen had developed a culture at a stage analogous to that of ancient Egypt or Babylon. And then almost all the humans, civilized or savage, savage had perished. This had happened only a thousand years before the first Wogglebug Columbus had landed on their great continent. At the time of the discovery, and for two centuries after, the Wogs had presumed the indigenes were extinct. But as the Wog colonists began penetrating the jungles and mountains of the interior, they encountered a few small groups of humanoids. These had retreated into the wilderness where they could hide as successfully as the African pygmies had hidden before the great rainforests were cut down. It was estimated there might be a thousand, maybe two thousand, scattered over an area of a hundred thousand square kilometers. And so We've got some, some world building sketched out here, even before Hal reaches the world. We've got a northern island, which is dominated by various insect species. We're going to encounter a few of them in the, the work. And the class of pseudoarthropoda. So what are arthropods? If you don't know what this uh, means, well, it's, it's a uh, group that includes not only insects, but also the arachnids, you know, spiders, uh, ticks, uh, all sorts of other things as well, and the crustaceans, and, and a few other classes as well. Farmers keeping it fairly simple here. And then there are the pseudoarthropoda. And this, the, you know, includes the woggle bugs, but also includes the lalitha, who are going to play a major role in uh, not just the, the love affair with Hal and Jeanette, she turns out to be one, but also in the prehistory of the human 
semi-human, human-like mammal species involved here. So we have insects and pseudoarthropods um, at the northern island, the southern island separated from a great distance of ocean, dominated by mammals, but there's still many insects there as well, as well as the very important pseudoarthropod, the lalitha. So there's some interesting discussions that take place between Hal, the human, and Phobo, the woggle bug, who is going to uh, help to explain to him uh, how evolution takes place here. So Hal first borrows a book on evolution, and um, uh, Phobo explains it, and then Hal refuses to believe Phobo. You say that a mammalian life originated from a primeval sea worm. That has to be wrong. We know the first land life form was an amphibian. Its, its fins developed into legs. It lost its ability to get oxygen from seawater. It evolved into a reptile, then a primitive mammal, then an insectivorous creature, then a pre-simian, then a simian, and eventually into the sapient bipedal stage, and then into modern man. So this is how things developed on Earth. And Phobo says, I don't doubt that things went just as you said, on Earth. But here, evolution took a different course. Here, there were three ancestral sebaktakufu, that is, mother worms. One had hemoglobin bearing blood cells, one copper bearing, one vandium bearing. The first had a natural advantage over the other two, but for some reason it dominated this, the southern continent, but not the others. We have evidence that the first also split early into two lines, both of which were notochords, but one of which wasn't mammalian. Anyway, all the mother worms did have fins, and these evolved into limbs. And then Hale says, evolution can't work that way. Your scientists have made a serious, a grievous error. After all, your paleontology is just beginning. It's only about 100 years old. And then Phobo says, you're too pterocentric, hidebound. You have anemic ana imagination. Your thought arteries are hardened. Consider the possibility there might be billions of habitable planets in this universe, and that on each evolution may have taken slightly or even vastly different paths. The great goddess nature is an experimenter. She'd get bored reproducing the same thing over and over, wouldn't you? And so, as it turns out, Phobo, at least in the narrative universe of this book, is going to be right, except for one thing. The, uh, the woggle bugs are not actually um, going to be, you know, their, their blood is not actually copper, uh, uh, you know, bearing, rather the iron bearing, right? It turns out to be something different altogether, and it's not vandium either, which is going to play a very important role in the, the later part where there's this, this conflict going on. But what we've got here is a very interesting alternative evolution, and that leads to different ways in which species live and interact. So we've got the woggle bugs, and why are they called woggle bugs? Uh, this is also tied in with the Oz again idea. Um, here we go. The Aborigines resembled Frank Baums, the Oz guy, right? Professor Wogglebug. Their bodies were rather round and their limbs were skinny in proportion. Their mouths were shaped like two broad and shallow V's, one set inside the other. Their lips were thick and lobular. Actually, a Wogglebug had four lips, each leg of the two V's being separated by a deep seam at the connection. Once far back on the evolutionary path, those limbs had been modified arms. Now they are rudimentary limbs, so disguised as true labial parts and so functional that no one could have guessed at their origin. When the wide V&V &V mouths opened in a laugh, they startled the Terrans. They had no teeth but serrated ridges of jawbone. A fold of skin hung from the roof of the mouth. Once the epipharynx, it was now a vestigial upper tongue. It was this or organ which gave the underlying trill to so many Ozigan sounds and gave the human being so much trouble reproducing them. So we've got here like an evolutionary account or natural history account of the, the wazzle bugs, um, their, their appearance and their their, their speech. Their skins were as lightly pigmented as Hal's, and he was a redhead, but where his was pink, theirs was a very faint green. Copper, not iron, carried oxygen in their blood cells, or so they said. That's a very important foreshadowing, right? 
So far, they'd, they'd refuse to allow the hijack to take blood samples, and we'll come back to that in a moment. So we have a description of their appearance, and throughout this, we see that they are very human-like in many respects. They have apartment complexes. They have developed science. They have their own version of psychiatrists, which, which Phobo is, right? They uh, have liquor joints and <laughs> places to go and hang out, bars. They have social casts. And so, you know, we're talking not just about physical evolution, but also the evolution of societies. And it's not that dissimilar from that of Earth. We find out as well that they are technologically behind Earth in many respects, except for biological weapons. And the Earth uh, invaders, as we're actually going to find out, are a bit worried about that. As, as it turns out, they don't have to be worried about that, but rather something else that's going to happen. Now, we also have these Oz again humans. And Jeanette is ostensibly the mixture of an Oz again indigenous human like species and a Earth. Uh, you know, spacefarer, a French guy who lands, all the rest of his crew is dead, but he uh, mates with her mother and her aunts. And uh, so she's kind of a hybrid, at least we think, until we find out later that she is actually a Lalitha, one of these um, pseudo arthropods who has adapted itself to human beings. And there's a, a long discussion by Phobo explaining this that he would have actually gotten, uh, Hal would have gotten from a book if he had read the book, but Jeanette puts him off of it because she knows it's going to bring him up. So what we find out is that the Lalitha have actually um, uh, brought about... A, a, a development in pseudo-human civilization, right? So Fobo tells this story, but he also says most of this is speculative. It's based largely on what the few human natives we've captured in the jungle have told us, but we also discovered pictographs in a long-buried temple that gave us additional information. So we think our reconstruction of the history of the Lalitha is valid. So what is that history? He says that they became integrated into pre-human societies. Some family and tribes accepted them. Others killed them. They resorted to artifice, disguised themselves as human women, a thing not hard to do unless they became pregnant. And so the Lalitha, would, they developed this back and forth interaction with humans. He goes on and he says, you'll find quite a tribal lore about them. Fables and myths make them central or peripheral characters. They were regarded as witches, demons, or worse. But with the introduction of alcohol in primitive times, a change for the better came to the Lalitha. Alcohol makes them sterile. It also makes them, practically speaking, immortal. So they remained at the physiological age of 25. The long lives of the Lalitha resulted in their being worshipped as goddesses. Sometimes they lived so long they survived the downfall of mighty nations that had been small tribes when the Lalitha first joined their groups. They became the repositories of wisdom, wealth, and power. Religions were established. Um, some cultures outlawed them. Um, the Lalitha themselves you know, sort of subverted that, and they gained mastery over their lovers, but not over themselves. They... They belonged to a secret society in the beginning, but they split up. They began to identify themselves with their nations that they ruled and to use their countries against their, the others. The result was assassination, struggles for power, and so on. Also, their influence was technologically too stabilizing. They tried to keep the status quo in every aspect of culture, and so the human cultures had a tendency to eliminate new and progressive ideas and the people who espoused them. So this is maybe what led to the collapse of the human civilization, which the Wogglebugs discover when they make it to the continent. And this is a collapse that has happened quite a, a while ago. One other aspect that's very important about Oz again is there are dangerous insect species. And so when they're going out to the bar to get some, some liquor, um, 
Hal is told by Phobo that you, you should carry some weapons, right? So Phobo has a sword. Um, they carry pistols when they go out in the jungle. And why do they do that? Because there are lots of insect species that have evolved. Some of them mimics. So, for example, uh, Hal and the, the, his gap run into a, something that appears to be like a hunched over woggle bug, but actually turns out to be an incredibly dangerous acid spitting insect that, try, that effectively you know, disables the gap, burning his eyes and his mouth and uh, almost kills Hal as well. There are also these dis- sort of ant-like creatures that end up eating porcelain, the gaps, corpse up a, a, a at first they kill him, and then as Hal leaves, they eat him all up. And um, there's, there's a lot of interesting other insect species, including the one that, that brews um, the, the liquor within its belly, right? So all of these are, um, you know, connected, and, and many of these insect species are semi-intelligent. And uh, they're, they're regarded as essentially being kind of vermin that have to be handled as such. And this brings us then to the final important discussion about Oz again. Who's going to control it? After all, the Earth ships from the Hijack Union, they went out there not just on a mission of discovery or something like that. They went there ostensibly, at least according to them, this isn't what they tell the Woggle Bugs, but to take over. There's a mission to produce a virus similar to the one that was deployed in the apocalyptic war referenced earlier on in the the, uh, work, a virus that will attack copper-bearing blood life forms like the woggle bugs and eliminate them. So humans can now move in and take over. And we get a few um, discussions of this going going on, uh, mostly towards the, there's a few references earlier on, but mostly towards the end. And this is part of why the, um, the Terrans, the Hijack Union people, wanted the blood samples from the Ozigan people, right? So um, he tells her that, he, t- he tells um, Hal, tells Jeanette that they have, have reached the point where the techs have made the globin locking molecule, which will cause, you know, sort of anemia in, in the copper um, bearing ones. So he says, the virus is already in production. In a week, a large enough supply would be made to fill the disseminators of six prowler torpedoes. So these torpedoes that would fly around, what we would call drones now. The plan was to release them to wipe out the city of Sido. They would fly in spirals whose range would expand into a large territory was covered. As they went out for reloading and went out again, the entire planet of Wogs would be slain. That's the plan there. And um, here we go. Um, There's a little bit more interesting discussion. Later on, as all the stuff about the Lalitha is coming to light, um, Hal is told about Project Earthman. Phobo's lips parted in a smile. I can't tell you now because your colleagues on the Gabriel might just possibly learn about it before it takes effect. However, I think I can tell you that we know about your plan for spreading the deadly globin locking molecule through our atmosphere. Hal says, there was a time when I would have been horrified to learn that, but now it doesn't matter. And then um, uh, Phobo says, you don't want to know how we found out about it? And Hal says, sure. When you asked us for samples of blood, you aroused our suspicion. We can't read your thoughts, but concealed in this flesh of his nose are two antennae. They are very sensitive. Evolution has not dulled our sense of smell as it has among you Terrans. They allow us to detect through odor very slight changes in the metabolism of others. When we were asked by one of your emissaries to donate blood for their scientific research, we smelled a, shall I call it, furtive emanation. We finally did give you the blood. But it was the blood of a barnyard creature which uses copper in its blood cells. We wogs use magnesium as the oxygen-carrying element in our blood cells. Our virus is useless? Yes, of course, in time when you'd learned to read our writing and got hold of our textbooks, you'd have discovered the truth. So this is very interesting. 
he goes on and he says, you know, we don't really want to do this, but you Earth people have been the aggressor. And our survival was at stake. So the means justified the ends. We captured a biochemist and his gap while they were visiting a laboratory. We injected a drug and hypnotized them. And we got the truth out of them. Um, and so we've got our own plans. And those plans come to a culmination. Basically, what they end up doing is digging underneath the Earth ship when trains are going by so that there won't be any uh, detection of the digging. And they fill up the entire compartment underneath the ship with gunpowder, set off an incredibly powerful charge, which causes a shock wave. It doesn't destroy the ship, which, of course, they want for the technology. But the shock wave kills everybody inside the ship including the people that are ready to set off a hydrogen bomb should there be any attempt to take over the ship, which means effectively not only was the Earth Hijack Union plot uh, revealed uh, through this, this attempt to get blood, right, but the Wogglebugs came up with their own solution. And very interestingly, there's this, this speech that is given at the very end about um, what they did and why they did it by FOBO. So he tells them, here we go, we're fairly peaceful, but unlike you Terrans, we're really realists. If we have to take action against vermin, we do our best to exterminate them. On this insect-ridden planet, we have a long history of battling killers. Then he also tells Hale, I don't include you among the vermin. You're free to go where, where you want, to do what you want. Hale says, you know, that's great. I've always wanted freedom, but what's there left for me? And Fobo reminds him now that there's actually a possibility for him being, as, he's, as Hale had suggested to Jeanette before, sort of like the new Adam and Eve. There's children to be raised, the children of him and Jeanette. And there's also Jeanette's sisters and aunts who they can locate. And Hal, of course, is still grief-stricken. But there's this promise that perhaps the Ozigan humans, or a, a new human amalgam, could in fact become uh, the you know, secondary race and live in proximity with, and perhaps even in society with, the Wogglebugs. And that's where the story ends with this wonderful world building that has taken place. I think, by the way, I'll close this. This would be very ripe for further development and sequelization. I'm sure somebody's actually done that out there somewhere, but it's, it's a, a very rich environment, this planet of Ozigan.